Welcome back to the Beginner's Astrophotography course. In this final video, I'm going to show you how to turn your raw images into a great final photo. Before we get started, you will need some software if you haven't gotten it already. The first application you'll want to get if you want to follow along with me today is Photoshop, Bridge, and Camera Raw. You can get all three for 10 bucks a month through Adobe's photography plan. Once you've gotten that software, if you want to go down that route, if not, there's other options. You're also going to need some type of stacking software. And we generally have three options. The first one that I very often use is Sequitor. I think that's how you say it. And you can download it here for free. He updates it fairly regularly, so you want to make sure if you have an older version, you upgrade that. For those on Mac, you'll want to grab Starry Sky Stacker. This one does cost some money though, but you can always try the free trial, see what you think, and then buy it. That's again for Mac users, Starry Sky Stacker. Jumping back to Windows, there's also Deep Sky Stacker. This is another free application, and this is mainly for those doing a little bit more advanced workflow, but you can always use it for what we're doing today. Like I said, I personally prefer Sequitor since I'm on Windows. It's fast, it's easy, and it normally does a good job. If you want, you could pause the video and grab all those different programs and get started. But for everybody else, we're gonna head back to Adobe Bridge. This is personally where I like to start off on. I've already gone through and created some folders here. We have JPEG, RAW, and TIFF and I've organized them accordingly. Everything right now is currently in the raw folder. And in this case, we are photographing Orion, which is the perfect object for these winter months. It's big, it's bright, it's easy to find, and you can pretty much do it all winter long. And I think the first thing I'll do is hit Control or Command A. That will select all of my images. And you can either right click, open in camera raw, or click this little circular button up top here. That will do the same thing. Once we have our images loaded up into camera raw, we're gonna do some basic edits, look over things and see how they look. I wanna stress right now that I'm doing my own personal workflow. The more traditional workflow that you're gonna find online, you generally wanna stack your raw photos and then begin processing, but I kinda of do it in reverse. This works really well for me, but for some people and some setups, this might not be ideal. And you might run into some problems, which we'll talk about later on. So I'd still recommend you follow along with me step by step today. And if you encounter some of these problems, you'll know why you're encountering them, and you might want to stick with the more traditional workflow that you'll find on virtually every other astrophotography channel. The first thing I'm looking at here is, of course, Orion. But you'll notice it started off kind of low, and that's going to be a problem. This was taken with my older Nikon D750, and one problem that a lot of the Nikon cameras have that you might have noticed is a purple glow somewhere in the frame. This is kind of one of Nikon's signature problems, if you will. In my case, it is at the bottom of the frame. Some cameras might be on the right or the left. And this is why I want you to go out and really test your camera that way you know where the problem areas are gonna be at. In other words, if I know that I'm gonna have a purple glow at the bottom of my photo, I might intentionally move Orion higher up in the frame when I'm taking my images, that way it's not a problem. The main reason we see these, in this case, purple glow, or maybe you have some type of banding, is because we didn't capture enough light in each exposure. This was only 32 seconds for my shutter speed. If I was able to shoot three or four minute long exposures though, that light would actually reduce the grain in the photo, it would reduce some other problems as well, and minimize the purple glow if not entirely remove it. And that's one reason I'm so adamant about capturing as much light as possible in each exposure. Let's continue on though. The main point I was trying to make here is that eventually I think I repositioned Orion, yeah, right down here. And I knew that was gonna be a problem, so I moved it higher up and I started a new sequence of images. And I think that's what I'm gonna work with. Another thing you might notice is that Orion starts off dead center here, but by the last photo, it's drifted pretty considerably. And that's actually a good thing. When the stars move a little bit between your first and last photo, that helps to even out some of the problems that might be caused by your camera sensor, including the grain and some of the more static problems because the stacking software has to line up these stars. And ultimately, a little bit of movement between your first and last photo is actually a good thing. And that's another topic for another day. All right, we've talked about some of the basics. Let's get into the actual editing. Now that I know what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna start right here. This is the first image from the second set. Normally what I do in this case is fix the overall exposure because right now it's a little too dark and the core is a little bit blown out. That's something you have to watch for in the Orion Nebula is the core is so bright that it's very easy to just clip all the detail and never get that back. In this case, what I'll do is I'll increase the exposure slider here on the right. 
this will make the image brighter. And in some ways it's almost like increasing the ISO in camera. If I go plus one, this is basically what the image would have looked like at ISO 12,800. We've doubled the ISO by going plus one. This gets a little bit more advanced and I've got a lot of other videos that go into this more, just kind of a side note. The reason I'm increasing the exposure though is to pull out these fainter dust clouds that you really didn't even notice before. I really want to showcase the entire nebula, not just the core. However, it's clearly blowing out the center way worse than it even was at the start. For that, I can go to the highlight slider here on the right and put that all the way down. And that's pretty amazing how well that worked. Here's highlights at zero, highlights at minus 100. We retained all this detail. I mean, the center core is still completely ruined. Oh well, that's to be expected. I mean, it was blown out from the start. There's nothing I can do about it. So I'll live with that for right now. And this is one reason I like editing my raw photos before stacking, because I can fix all these problems before everything gets scrunched together. And for me, that works better. But as I mentioned, it might not work for everybody. Now that we've gotten the overall contrast looking good, we can work on the saturation. And I recommend you increase the saturation slider all the way to 100. This is gonna allow you to see any extreme color cast in the photo. I noticed that the sky itself is kind of orange and that's not very pleasing, even if it is somewhat accurate. I'd rather have it more of a neutral gray or black. And the way to do that is to go back up to your temperature and tint sliders and then move them, whatever looks good to your eye. I wanna caution you not to go too cold and too warm. Again, my goal is to get this as neutral as possible where there's no noticeable color cast. That can be hard to do, but try your best. In this case, I think that's gonna work okay. I can always tweak it later. It's not that important, as long as it doesn't look terrible. And if I'm happy with that, I'll lower the saturation back down to maybe 20 or 30, just so there is a little bit of color in the photo. You're free to continue messing with these sliders, like the shadows and the blacks. My only point here would be, don't get too much contrast right at the start, because the more contrast you add, you're gonna have less flexibility later on. What I'm looking for when I do this is a flat, neutral gray image as much as possible. I don't wanna have the sky completely black or the whites really bright or anything else. I wanna preserve as much detail and give me a nice starting point. Let's move down now to the detail tab on the right. This is really important because by default, camera raw applies 40 sharpening and that's gonna accentuate the grain in your photo and we don't want that. So I always turn the sharpening down to zero then we have noise reduction and color noise reduction. This is another reason I like doing this workflow because almost everybody else has a lot of color noise in their photos. Watch what happens. When I put the color noise slider to zero, we have a lot of this ugly rainbow pattern, and this is especially prevalent from what I've noticed on some Canon cameras. If you were stacking your raw data, this is all gonna be included because it's not getting removed as we are doing today. And it's just one more reason I like using this workflow because by default, camera raw gets rid of it and it's no longer a concern. If you only have a handful of photos, maybe let's say 20 or 30, and they're all fairly short exposures, like 30 seconds, then you might wanna do a little bit of noise reduction right now because you know you don't have as much data as you should. In this case, I know I've got a lot of photos, so I'm not really worried about it. But just to show you, if you want to do a little bit of this noise reduction, you can go maybe 10 to 20. I wouldn't go any higher than 30 though, because you're going to start losing some of the finer detail and it's going to look more like a painting than anything. So I recommend you leave noise reduction to zero unless you have just a ton of grain and only a handful of photos, then maybe 10 to 15 or 20. Always keep it as low as possible though to retain as much detail. We can zoom out now and we have one problem left. That is the vignette caused by my lens. And this is a problem that's been popping up more and more recently because in the past, I never really had a problem with it. Let me exaggerate it though so I can show you what I'm talking about. And I don't want you to do this necessarily, but see how there's these very dark corners and there's that purple glow from the Nikon sensor. We need to get rid of this. We want it completely flat from corner to corner. Otherwise it's gonna look really weird. One way you can do that here in Camera Raw is to go to the Optics tab on the right. The optics tab allows you to fix distortion and vignette and all other things with most lenses out there. All you really have to do is click use profile corrections. It should automatically find your lens, manufacturer, and everything else. If it can't find it, you'll have to search for it manually and just verify it is the correct model. 
In this case, I'm using the older version of the Tamron, not the G2 version, and it's smart enough to know that. If you're gonna be doing this though, you need to make sure you turn the distortion from 100 to zero. I've seen a lot of problems where the distortion correction can cause really weird artifacts after stacking. So it's very important you don't forget to put distortion to zero if you're gonna go this route. Another problem I've seen is that even with the vignette correction at 100, there might still be some dark corners or this could lead to some problems later on, which we'll see in a few minutes. So I'd like you to at least try putting the vignette to 100, stacking your photos, and if you notice some problems, you'll know most likely what's causing it. And in that case, you would wanna take flat frames. That's an entirely separate video though. So if you do encounter problems, uh, we'll get to that later on. But anyway, the big thing here is just removing those dark corners with one click, profile corrections, and turning off the distortion, which actually will cause some artifacts. Now that we've fixed that problem and we've really made the image look terrible in the process, that's not a big deal. I can put it back to where it was. And that's what you should expect. You know, your raw photos aren't going to look very good because most of our camera sensors weren't designed for astrophotography. We're making use of them for it. But generally, these are designed to be shot during the day where there's a lot of light coming into the camera. And everything you're seeing here, that's basically white noise generated by your camera sensor. And the more light you capture, the less obvious it will be. All right, so I'm gonna put everything back to the starting point, and then we'll be ready to go and stack these images. Again, I want it neutral gray, kind of flat, something like that. With all of our changes applied, I'm gonna scroll all the way down to my last photo, hold down the shift key, and click on it. If you did that correctly, all the thumbnails will be selected. We wanna sync these settings now so every raw photo has the same edits applied. And the way we'll do that is clicking this little button right here, or you can right click sync settings. When this window comes up, just hit okay. Everything should be set correctly. I've never really had to change anything. And there we are. Every photo now has the exact same edits applied. Finally, we need to save these as TIFF files so we can begin stacking them. And the way you would do that is either right click, save images, save images, or you can click the little, it kind of looks like a download button provide all your thumbnails are still selected. Either way, you should get to this interface here. And what we want to do now is specify our file name. I've actually got two things here. I need to get rid of that. And because we've already stayed organized, I'm going to hit select folder up top. I want to place these in my TIFF folder that I created earlier in the video. If you don't have a TIFF folder, you can right click new folder and call it TIFF and we'll save everything in there. For the color space, I recommend sRGB unless you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, make sure it's on sRGB or you're gonna run into problems later on. And then for the color depth, you can do 16 bits per channel. That's gonna give you the most information. Although to be honest, most monitors and displays aren't, you really can't even see the difference. So in my case, I'm gonna leave it on eight bits, but most people will tell you to put it to 16 just cause you have more data at the end of the day. In this case, it's just a demo, so I'm not gonna worry about it. Everything else looks good though. We've got our file extension set as TIFF, format as TIFF, we're choosing the right folder, sRGB, then I'll hit save. Once we finish saving all our images, we'll pick back up and start our stacking. If you don't see any more photos remaining in the lower portion of the screen, then you're all finished and you can click done in the lower right. Depending on your stacking software, you might have some additional work to do. And what I mean by that is, if you're using mainly just Sequitor, that application does not have any way to rate your photos. So if some are blurry or they have a problem, you need to remove them yourself. However, if you're gonna be using an application like Deep Sky Stacker or Starry Sky Stacker on the Mac, those both have an algorithm that will automatically throw out your bad photos. Let me just show you real quick. If I load these files in, I'll hit check all, register checked pictures. This is what I'm getting at. If you're using Deep Sky Stacker or Starry Sky Stacker on the Mac, you can select the best, let's say 90% of photos. And that means if it finds some that are blurry, it won't even bother to include them, it'll just get rid of them. But for those who are using Sequitor, which I am today, we don't have that luxury. And that means you wanna come into your TIFF folder here in Bridge, click on your first image, and you should see a preview window somewhere on the screen. Then you can click with your magnifying glass 
and you'll get a 100% crop. It's probably actually more than that. And I just move it around somewhere where I can see the stars fairly well. I want to see some of the bigger, brighter stars, maybe right there. Next, I'll use the arrow keys to go here one by one and see how the stars have shifted pretty dramatically. This one, they're streaked. This one, they're a little bit more subdued, if you will. This one, they're streaked again. To be honest, a lot of these do not look good. And that's to be expected because I'm just using a Sky Guider Pro with no Auto Guider. And this is a whole nother series of videos that I actually have already done on some of my courses on my website. I've also got a few here on YouTube. But the point of an Auto Guider is to fix these problems that you're seeing here. Because every single photo looks a little bit differently. And that's going to translate to not the sharpest final image. When you have an Auto Guider though, that's going to make your mount or your star tracker run much more accurately. It's going to allow you to shoot longer exposures, and you're not going to have every image looking differently. They should all look pretty uniform, and ultimately that will give you much better results. In this case, though, we're just going to have to live with it. These photos are a few years old, and I thought they'd be very representative of what you might encounter as well, so that'd be good for us to go through this. What this ultimately means is that if you find one that's just really bad, like this one here, where it's really streaking, you want to delete it, because this is only going to hurt us in the long run. I can right-click, delete, and then get rid of it. Realistically, I'd probably delete 90% of these photos because they're not as sharp as I would like, but then I'd have no data and my final image would be very grainy. And this is where you just gotta practice, get your polar alignment better, get your weight balancing better, and then consider getting that auto guider once you're feeling comfortable because that's gonna be a whole new workflow and a lot more to learn. In this case though, like I said, none of my images are really that sharp and therefore I'm not really too worried about it. It's just something I got to live with in this case. Let's say now we've gone through and deleted all of our really bad photos. In this case, not really. Then we can go on to our stacking software. And again, if you're using the Mac stacking software or Deep Sky Stacker, you don't have to do that step. But since I'm using Sequitor today, I do. Once you load up your image stacking software, it's all going to be largely the same thing. The first thing you want to do in this case is double click star images and load in those files. I'm going to go to my TIFF folder here and then select the remaining TIFF files that didn't get deleted. After you've loaded in your TIFF files, this will be the same thing on virtually every stacking software. You could also add in your dark, your bias, and your flat frames, but I'm not going to include any of those today. That's why I suggested if you have problems with this workflow, you go watch some of the other guys where they show you a different workflow that's much more commonly used. And in that case, you would be using flat frames and dark frames and everything else for a potentially better result. I normally don't need to take those though. I find they're a waste of time for me personally. That doesn't mean that's going to be true for you though. So bear that in mind. Because we're only using our light frames today, nothing else. Now I can just name my final image, which I'll double click on output. And you can call this whatever you want. I'll call it Segwitter Stack. Our next goal is to figure out what settings we're going to use for our stacking software. If we come down here, our first tab is Composition Align Stars, and below that it says Accumulation. You're not going to want to use Accumulation. That's not what we're trying to do today, because that might add in all the junk that we would normally want to get rid of. So for most of us, we're going to choose Select Best Pixels, and you can read it right there if you do it on your own. It'll say it's going to remove satellites and planes and things like that. So even if you have a plane streaking across your photo, this algorithm will get rid of it because it can see that it doesn't belong in the photo. So this is a really powerful algorithm. And if you're going to be using uh, Deep Sky Stacker, this would be called Sigma Clipping, which again, I point you to some other videos to see how to use Deep Sky Stacker. That's really all we have to do. I'm not really going to worry about anything else. High dynamic range, not going to worry about it. Dynamic noises, that's all looking good. I'm just going to leave everything turned off. Keep it very simple today. So as long as you put select best pixels for your stacking al algorithm, you can hit start. It's going to go through. And now what it's trying to do is line up all the stars from our first photo to our last photo. And that's what I was getting at earlier. Because if my Orion Nebula started here and drifted down here, it's going to have to work pretty hard to line up all the stars back to a same central location. In the process, though, that movement should smooth out a lot of the problems that could have been caused by your camera sensor. And this is another topic called dithering, which I think I've done a video on here on YouTube where I go into it, how to do it with the ASIR Pro. The basics of dithering though, is that after every single photo you take, 
the camera and lens and everything else moves slightly, maybe up, and then your camera takes another photo, and then maybe the camera moves to the right, takes another photo, moves to the left, and it keeps doing that after every single image, only by a few pixels, but the end result is that it should smooth out a lot of the junk caused by your sensor. If you have a nice big go-to mount, this would be a very good thing to do, this dithering, and that can really increase the quality of your final image. For those who bought a Star Tracker like the Star Adventure or the Skyguider Pro like I have, dithering, you can do it if you have the right gear, but you're not really doing dithering because it's a long story. The short version is though that on my Skyguider Pro I can't really dither correctly and therefore it's kind of a waste of time. I know I'm rambling a bit here but we're just waiting for this to finish. So getting back on track there, my point was that if you are having a lot of problems with your photos and you have a go-to mount, look into dithering. It's fairly easy to set up, provided you've got all the uh, laptop and things like that, or the ASA Air Pro, and it can really take your image a long way. I also want to stress one more time that this is somewhat of an alternate workflow that tends to work well for Nikon and Sony cameras. For some Canon cameras and the dedicated Astro cameras, which are really high-end, you wouldn't necessarily want to go this route. In those cases, what I'd recommend, and what virtually everybody else does, is start off in an application like Deep Sky Stacker. And then from here, you would open up your picture files. Rather than loading in the TIFF files that we edited though, you would load in the raw data where no edits have been applied. And in this case, we'll just grab a few for the heck of it. Once you've loaded it in your, we call them light frames, these are the photos of the Orion Nebula, You'd also want to go grab your flat frames and your dark frames and your bias frames if you took them. We didn't really talk about it in the previous video because if you're just getting into this, you don't necessarily need them right out of the gate unless you are using a dedicated astro camera. But it's not a bad idea to take them just so you have them. But again, you would click on your dark frames, for example, select all your dark frames, your flat frames, select all of those. Then you would go through, and this is a whole other video. I'm just kind of briefly explaining what you'd do. Anyway, I just wanted to show you the alternate workflow if today's workflow doesn't work that well for you. And again, you'll want to watch some other videos for that. Once this is complete, we'll pick back up and start into Photoshop. And I will be including my TIFF file in the description below. So if you'd like to follow along once we get into Photoshop, you can do that. I'd recommend it just so you can practice these techniques. We're going to be using a lot of curves and levels and layer masks and things like that. So if you're still new to this, uh, it might be a good idea to grab that TIFF file and follow along for the next couple steps. Okay, we're finally done. That took four minutes. That's a lot longer than usual. And I think that's because the stars drifted so much from the first to the last photo, it really had to work to line them back up. And this is our final result. You can already tell it looks way cleaner than it did at the start. So I'm really excited to take a look at this closely. We can click open up top here. That'll bring us right into Photoshop or you can go find it yourself and grab it. We'll talk about this image here more in a minute. Okay, this looks really nice in terms of the detail and the cleanliness. Just for a comparison, I'm gonna grab one of the TIFF files and we'll do a side by side. You can see this particular TIFF file had a, probably a satellite, or maybe that's a plane satellite, going right through it. And this was just one photo out of many. So let's do our before and after. Here's a single exposure, looks terrible, as you would expect, versus our stack of about 60 photos. See how much more clean and detailed that looked? I mean, that's almost a night and day difference. And that's why you, when you're out there, you wanna capture a minimum of one hour of images. So I took 60 30 second photos, I'll let you do the math, and that's a pretty good amount. Even though the stars were fairly blurry in every single photo too, the end result doesn't look terrible. Another thing you want to be looking for is any kind of streaking across the image or like banding. You'll definitely notice it if you zoom into these kind of faint nebula regions. So if you see a lot of horizontal or vertical lines, that's caused by your camera sensor. And if you try taking your dark and bias frames, that might help to an extent. The best thing you can do though is that technique we talked about, which is dithering. Or if none of that works, your last resort is to just buy a new camera that's what I kind of stressed in the very first video in this series, is that if your camera sensor isn't up to the challenge of astrophotography, you're just going to be in for a lot of nightmares, which are going to start becoming apparent at this part in the workflow. The Nikon D750, though, still does a great job. 
and I'm not noticing any sensory level problems besides the purple glow, which is something I've accounted for. I know it's there and I know how to work around it. All right, let's get into this now. If you're not familiar at all with Photoshop, I'd recommend you go watch some other YouTube videos. That'll get you comfortable with the interface. Or you can check out my Astro Post Processing course on my website. I've got a beginner's course in there that will teach you the basics of Photoshop and really get you comfortable with all these different things we're going to talk about today. In my case, I have my adjustments window here. You might want to pause the video and try and organize things like you see here, just so it's a little bit easier to follow along with. And like I said, make sure you have my TIFF file so you can practice with us step by step. The first thing you generally want to do is add a levels adjustment, which we have right here. It kind of looks like a crown in some ways. Once you have the levels adjustment though, you should see a window like this. This spike represents all the detail visible in our photo. If you did the alternate workflow where you took the raw images in a deep sky stacker, which we talked about briefly, more than likely this spike is all the way to the left and it's just a little tiny thing. And your goal in that case would be to stretch the histogram to pull out more detail. But I'll leave that for another video. In this case, what I want to do is move these two sliders here, the, the midpoint here, and then the black point over here to match the spike. And the way this works is if I move the black point to the back of the spike, that makes the image a little bit darker and gets rid of that gray haze. And then if I move the midpoint slider here to the left, that brings out some of the fainter dust clouds and it really allows you to see all the beautiful stuff that was hidden in the photo. This is going to be up to you though to figure out how far you want to push it. In my case, I want to keep it fairly subdued. Now would be a good time to mention that if you start noticing weird concentric circles in your photo, like you see here, yeah, there's like a, a bright spot and then it's dark in the center and then it's dark and then it's bright. If you see problems like this, chances are there's two underlying problems. The first is that you have light pollution that you're shooting through, which is going to affect most people. The second is that if you're using my workflow today, when we did that vignette correction, that can introduce some of these problems that you see here where the center is darker than the edges and it just doesn't look proper. So if you run into this problem where you have these weird concentric circles almost, then this is where you'd really want to go back and do the alternate, more traditional workflow where you take your raw photos in a deep sky stacker, include your flat frames most importantly, and if you take your flat frames, that will fix this problem. Again, I'd point you to some of the other astrophotographers here on YouTube to see how to do that. They've got a lot of videos. For me, I use this alternate workflow that works really well in most cases. And I don't have the concentric circles because A, I was in a very dark sky, and B, my lens and the vignette correction worked really well. And that's always been the case for me, but not necessarily the case for other people. All right, so with this levels adjustment, getting back on track here, all I really did was make it a little bit brighter. And if I turn on and off the eyeball, I can decide if I really like that or not. For example, here in the core of Orion, I'm starting to lose some of those nice colors because I've moved the midpoint too far to the left. See that? And that's why I always recommend doing small, subtle, incremental changes. Don't do anything too radical in one step because then you're just kind of working yourself into a corner. In that case, that's what I'm looking for. The sky is just a little bit darker. And if we look back at our levels, all I really did was move this black point to the back of the spike. If you've got that looking fairly good, we can go back to our adjustments tab. And this time I normally add a curves layer. Once you have a new curves layer, we see that same spike, but up top over on the left, we have a little hand tool. With this hand tool selected, you can click any point in the photo and make it brighter or darker. For example, if I want to zoom in here and make these dust clouds a little bit brighter, I can click and drag my mouse upwards. What that did is if we look on our graph here on the right, I added a point and I moved it upwards above the 45 degree angle. Then I can choose an area in the sky that should be darker, maybe over here, click and drag my mouse downwards. And what do we notice? Our graph now has this nice S curve to it. You need to be really careful doing this though, especially with Orion, because I've completely blown out the core now. And we see that reflected in the graph on the right. Wherever you see a straight line, like at the very top here, that means all that data is being clipped. So you can either lower the brightness till it's no longer a straight line, or you can manually add a point just by clicking on the graph and then rolling that off. Again, you gotta be careful here though, cause you can really mess things up. And this just takes a lot of practice 
on your own photos. If I like that, and I think it looks okay, maybe it's just a little bit too strong though. One of the great features of Photoshop is we have an opacity slider right here, it currently says 100%. If I take that from 100% to maybe 25 or 50, I can just turn down the effect. And this is something I do all the time as I lower the opacity of my layers. That way I get part of the effect, but I don't overdo it. With our new curve layer here, the next thing I wanna do is fix the blue contrast and the colors, because right now the sky should be black, not blue. For that, we'll go back to our adjustments tab, add another curves layer, just by clicking the button. And you've got a lot of ways to fix a color cast. By far the easiest is to choose the black point dropper, which will be the top one of the three. This black point dropper, you just click somewhere in the photo, and it's gonna try and get that black. So if I were to click in the center of the nebula, it's really gonna mess it up because it's trying to make that black. And you can just keep clicking until things look good to you. One thing I wanna caution you on though, is that this black point clicker will affect the luminosity and the color. And generally, I only wanna affect the color to start off with. To put that very simply, over here we have a little tab called normal. If you click where it says normal, you can change that to just color at the very bottom. And that's what I'd like you to do for this layer. So you can click on where it says normal and change that to color at the bottom. Now this curves layer will only affect the colors in the photo, not the brightness. And I can do the same thing one more time. I'll grab my black dropper and click in various parts of the photo until the color cast is largely neutralized. The big problem I have here though is the purple glow caused by my Nikon sensor. If I would have been able to shoot two or three minute exposures, this would be largely gone. If I would have included dark frames, that could have also helped to reduce this problem. But because I wanted to simplify things as much as possible, that is one of the downsides of this method that we're using today. But just keep clicking until the sky is at least not having an extreme color cast. Like that to me looks very neutral, especially compared to before. See how much better that looks. I think we'll go with that today. It'd also be a good point to mention that these layers here, you can rename by double clicking on it. If I want to change this to from curves to, to let's say color fix, I can do that. And then this one was a contrast fix. And then same with the levels, but we know that. That's just good practice to keep your layers organized so you don't get confused when you come back and look at this TIFF file in a couple of days or weeks. All right, so this has already come a long way. We can see the, a lot of these faint dust clouds around Orion, although it is somewhat obscured by the purple glow. My next goal is to fix the overall contrast one more time, and for that, I like using a curves layer. When I add my new curves layer, you can either click the black point dropper this time and change the blending mode from normal to luminosity. Now we're affecting the brightness. So watch what happens with the black point selected, I can click and it's trying to make wherever I click nice and dark. So this is another easy way to do it and we're not affecting the color anymore because this is only affecting the luminosity. Alternatively, if that's a little too strong, you can undo it by clicking this little arrow right here. And you can try and fix this manually. I'm gonna put it back to normal, so we're affecting everything. The way we're gonna fix this manually, the color cast and the contrast mainly, is with the hand tool. So just, we're kinda of starting over here. We have a new curves layer, hand tool selected, and I just wanna make the sky darker. So I'll click and drag down, just like that. If you find it made some of those faint dust clouds completely disappear, then you can maybe click and drag those up, like so. Just watch that you don't blow out the core too bad. And the more contrast adjustments we do like this, the more any problems are gonna become visible. In this case, that purple glow is really starting to stand out. If you had any kind of banding in your photos, like horizontal or vertical, that would start to show up as well. So this is really kind of a torture test to see how well your camera performs. And like I said at the very start of the first video, if you have a lot of problems here, well, the first thing to do would be to try the other workflow where you take dark, flat, and bias frames, that might help. But if you're still having a lot of problems, then the only really other thing you can do is buy a new camera because your sensor just can't handle this workflow and astrophotography as well as we'd like. So that's something to keep in mind. In this case, I know that if I want to get better images, I just need to shoot longer exposures or maybe take darks and that might help to some extent. My next goal is to crap out all the junk because it's starting to get annoying. And over on the left, you've got a crop tool. 
In this case, it's defaulting to 16 by 9, which I don't want. So I'll put it back to original ratio. With our crop borders visible here, we can bring this in. And chances are you're going to have some edging where the photos didn't quite line up. So at the very least, you want to get rid of those edges where you can notice some weird problems. And I'm going to try and crop out most of that purple glow so it's not distracting from the nebula itself. Maybe right around there. Then I'll hit the check mark. That reminds me of one important thing. Up top here, delete crop pixels. It might look like a different button depending on your version of Photoshop, but you want to look up top and look for anything that talks about deleting cropped pixels. If that's checked, then when you crop your image, you're never going to be able to get that data back. And you might want to if you want to recrop your image. So I highly recommend you deactivate this little checkbox here for delete crop pixels. That will allow you to go back and recrop this whenever you want. Again, make sure delete crop pixels is unchecked and that will stick from now on. That's what you want to have. And there we go. So that doesn't look terrible. I mean, it still needs a lot of work. I think the next thing we'll try is a selective color. And you'll find that in this case, bottom row, second from the right. Selective color is going to allow us to target different colors in the photo and really exaggerate them or subdue them. This is one of my favorite tools. With a selective color added, we can choose from each of the main color channels, reds, yellows, blues, etc. The first thing I'll try is the magentus color channel, and then I can move these sliders left and right. My goal now is to reduce the purple glow at the bottom of the photo with the help of these sliders. And you can see I can almost turn it off, like so. I'd rather have it black and white than uh, extreme purple, and I can do that right here. And you're going to notice that this will affect the center of the nebula, which I don't want. Don't worry about that. All I care about is the problem area right now. I'll show you how to fix the rest later on. If I'm happy with that, then maybe there's still some red down here that needs to get removed. I can change the magentas to reds and do the same thing. Kind of just hone in on the bottom of the photo and then move these sliders left and right to either hide or subdue the problem. I think that looks okay there. All right, now that we've done these adjustments, here's our before and after. The bottom of the frame no longer has that purple glow. It's more of a monochrome, which is fine with me. But the center of the nebula is completely messed up. The way you're going to fix that is with this layer mask right here. This is a whole other video. But very simply, if you see a white layer mask, that means whatever changes we've done are applying to the entire photo. I don't want it to apply to the nebula, though. I can grab a black paintbrush from the left and then make sure the top color is black down here. If it's not black, you can just hit these little arrows. That'll swap you back and forth. With my paintbrush selected with black as my top color and my layer mask here is highlighted, I can now paint out whatever I don't want, just like that. This, if you're a little bit confused, like I said, you might want to do some other YouTube tutorial videos. That way this makes more sense to you because you really need to understand layer masks for the best result. There we go though. Here's our before and after. Now our selective color is only targeting the problem areas. I know we're kind of going through a lot here, but if I hold down the alt or option key and click on my layer mask, I can see what I've done. I've turned off the lights of that selective color adjustment just over the nebula. So wherever it's black, it's not going to apply to. To get back to our normal view, I can just click on the layer selective color and we're back where we need to be. And to be thorough, I can double click on the name here and we'll call this purple glow removal. Then I'll go back to my adjustments up top and add a new selective color layer. Again, bottom row, second from the right. With this new selective color layer, now I can target the nebula itself. Maybe I want to go back to the magentas and really turn those up. Something like this. You, you've got to be careful though. You don't overdo it. And that's very easy to do. If you like the magentas though, you can switch to the blue color channel and do the same thing. There's a lot of photos of Orion online though. Maybe you want to take it in a certain direction, but this is a great way to slightly alter the colors in your photo, depending on the effect you want. After I've gotten blue looking good, I'll change to cyans and do the same thing. And even if this affects the bottom of the image, that's okay. We can just paint that out. So you got to start thinking of it like that, where you can selectively target what you want. In this case, I'll select my layer mask by clicking on it. 
grab a, well, let me show you this. If I hold down the alter option key and click on my layer mask, it's all white. I can invert it though with control or command I, that will turn it all black. So we've just turned off the effect by making our layer mask black. And you'll see that right here. Now what I can do is grab a white paintbrush, make sure it is actually white. And we have our layer mask selected. This is going to take some practice, don't worry. But with our black layer mask selected and a white paintbrush selected, I can paint in exactly where I want these changes to be. So I'm only going to be affecting the nebula now, nowhere else in the photo where I don't want it. Just like that. If we think that looks good, we can hold down the alt or option key, click on our layer mask again, and make sure we filled in everything we intended to. It's also not a bad idea to blur that layer mask so there's no definitive lines anywhere. And I recommend you do this all the time. The way we're going to blur this layer mask is filter, blur, Gaussian blur. And as long as you don't have any harsh edges, then nobody will be ever able to tell that you did something, as long as you do it subtly, of course. And this is one of the biggest problems I see, mainly for Milky Way photography, is that people will do changes like this, but they have very harsh edges at the edges of the Milky Way, and you can instantly tell what they did. But if they would have just blurred their layer mask, or if they even created one to begin with, you wouldn't be able to tell as bad. So there we go. There's our color adjustments just affecting the nebula, and there is our diffuse layer mask. Things are coming along. The image itself is starting to fall apart because we are doing so many adjustments and the data to begin with wasn't the best, but we can still make it work. I think I'm actually gonna go back and add one more selective color at this point because I tend to really like to push the colors in a certain direction and this is the best way to do it. It's also the easiest. So maybe I'll really get some red coloration out of the magenta there and then push those blues a little bit further like so. Now, rather than having to go through and do those exact same adjustments to this selective color layer, you know, where we make it black and then paint in white. If you've already got a layer mask that you like, you can hold down the alt or option key, click and drag this up, let go. If you did that correctly, you've now copied the layer mask and saved yourself a lot of time. Again, that is holding down the alt or option key and clicking and dragging one layer mask to the other. All right, we're really starting to go on long today. I didn't want it to go this long. <laughs> so we're gonna kind of wrap it up. The next thing I'll do is hit control shift Alt E or Command Shift Option E if you're on a Mac. I know that's a lot of keys, but you want to make sure you write those down and remember them. Again, that's Control Shift Alt E or if you're on a Mac, Command Shift Option E. If you did that correctly, it should create a new layer, in this case called Layer 1. With Layer 1 selected, we'll go up to Filter, Camera Raw Filter. This is our last chance to fix any kind of problems that were baked in in the photo. And for those who are maybe using another workflow, this might be really important. The first thing I want to do in this case is fix any color noise or overall grain in the photo. And just like we did at the start of the video, I can go to the Detail tab. We see Sharpening, Noise Reduction, Color Noise Reduction. Then I'll zoom into an area that showcases some problems. See how it looks pretty nasty when we zoom in like that? That's mainly because Sequitur and the stacking algorithm, it works well, but occasionally doesn't do the best job, especially after all those contrast adjustments we did. And in this case, the first thing I want to fix is this kind of ugly pixelated color noise. Just by increasing the color noise selection, even just to 15 or 25. I wouldn't go further than 25 unless you really have a lot of problems here. And if you do, that might be one more reason to think about getting a new camera sensor because you shouldn't have that much color noise to begin with. The default would be 25, but the lower the better, because it will eat away some of the color detail. In this case, I'll go with probably 20. And if your photo's still kind of grainy, like it is in this case, then you'd want to increase the noise reduction slider as needed. Just like before though, don't go too far. This is going to start looking like a watercolor painting, and you're going to lose any sharp edges that you might have had. And if that's the case, you know, if it still looks very grainy, then your next goal would just be on your next night out, capture more exposures and try and shoot longer exposures to begin with rather than 30 seconds try and get up to a minute if you can still get sharp stars ultimately the best way to reduce the grain in your photo is to capture more light that's the number one thing in this case i'll probably just go to 15 take some of the edge off and there we go that looks 
Really nice. Because we are here in Camera Raw, this is an easy way to do your edits if you're still getting started because you don't have to worry about curves and levels and all that stuff. If you see contrast, you can just move it up and increase the contrast. Or maybe you want to bring down the highlights or add a vignette or whatever else you want to do. This is a very easy way to do things. and I'd recommend you spend some time and see if you can get the image looking a little bit better with the help of these sliders. There's no right or wrong answer here. Just move it and see if it looks good or not. That's all I ever do, really. Also, if you have a color cast that's still in the photo, you can try adjusting the temperature and the tint. Although I'd be cautious with these because they can really mess things up quickly. In my case, I already had a good color cast. I'm not going to worry about it. That's all I want to do here. There's a lot more functionality we don't have time to get into, but I'd recommend you spend some time experimenting with all the different features of Camera Raw. In this case, I'll hit OK. And there we go. Here is our before. It's really pixelated in here and after. It's much smoother. Could look better, but that's just because my images I didn't have as many as I would like. All right, the final problem I have with the photo is just that faint glow at the bottom of the frame. One easy way to fix that without needing any plugins is to add another curves layer. Then with this new curves layer, you can click on the hand tool, find a spot down here where we want to make darker, click and drag down. Don't worry if it messes up the rest of the photo. In this case, it's still not dark enough, so I'm going to click and keep dragging it down. I mean, I actually kind of like the way the rest of the photo looks, but my main goal was just to turn down the brightness of this area. Once you've gotten the brightness of that problem area taken care of, over on the left, you might find it under the paint bucket tool. We're looking for the gradient tool though, and you should be able to find it again under the paint bucket. With the gradient tool selected, it's pretty simple. Just click and drag, and eventually it's going to work out properly. What's happening though? In this case, it's doing the exact opposite of what I want. So let's take a look at our layer mask. Remember, black means we're turning off the effect. White means we're turning it on. And that's exactly what we see here. I'm only turning on that darkening up top, which is the opposite of what I want. So rather than dragging down from the top, let me drag up from the bottom. There we go. That's what I want to see, where it's only targeting the bottom of the frame. I can even go side to side or from corner to corner. This has a lot of uh, useful applications, but in this case, I only want it to apply to the very bottom, just bleeding into the nebula a little bit. Let's say I like that right there. We've, it's a little too dark though, right? So if that's the case, well, the first thing I do is go up to filter, blur, Gaussian blur. I want to blur out that mask even more so there's no fine line from dark to light. This is something I always recommend you do. If you smash that minus button, you can see what it's going to do there. This is where we're at right now. It's pretty def uh, defined. So if I increase the radius to 600 plus, 500 plus, now it's much less noticeable. It's more of a subtle change all over. The last thing you can do if it's a little too dark down there is click back on your curves layer and change the opacity from 100%. Maybe you want to go back down to zero and just increase it until the problem is no longer visible to your eye. In this case, maybe 60% or 70. I always recommend you turn on and off the eyeball to make sure that looks good. And I think that turned out really well, considering all the problems we had along the way. Now would be a good time to go to File, Save. It should already be a TIFF file, so we can just uh, hit OK here. And there we go. Because this is a TIFF file, you have access to all of these layers at any time. And this is important because I always recommend you give the image time to rest. In other words, come back tomorrow, open up this TIFF file and take a look at things. You might immediately notice that there's a color cast or that the vignette correction you just did looks fake and you just didn't notice it before. There's a lot of little problems that your eyes are probably not seeing right now because you spent so much time staring at the photo. So before I ever share this online, I give it a day or two to rest. I come back, open it up with fresh eyes, and I'll immediately see if there's any problems. Then I can come through here on my levels and layers and all that, change them as needed, continue adding adjustments, and then finally I can save this as the JPEG. For that, we'll go up to Image, Mode, and we're going to change this from 16 bits to 8 bits because, like I said, almost every device out there is not going to be able to display 16 bits. It's just a waste of space. 
And you're also gonna get a small error message otherwise. Again, we're under image mode, eight bits per channel. I'd only recommend doing this after you've made sure you've saved your TIFF file and you're not gonna mess anything up. All right, now that we're eight bits per channel, we'll go up to file, save as, navigate to our JPEG folder. If you don't have one, create one now. And then most importantly, change the save as type from TIFF to JPEG, and you can name it whatever you want. If you look closely, I have a little check mark here next to ICC profile sRGB. This is one of the most important things you want to do. If this says Adobe RGB or Pro Photo or anything else other than sRGB, when somebody looks at this on their phone or on their TV or on their monitor, this might not display correctly the colors that is. And it can look really weird, especially if you're doing portraits with skin tones. It makes them look kind of reddish. And this is one of the problems that I see a lot of people uh, don't even catch on. So make sure that this says ICC profile sRGB and the box is checked. Otherwise your colors will not display accurately for most people viewing your photo and that's not going to help you out at all. If this doesn't say sRGB here, if it says Adobe or Pro Photo, I want you to cancel out of this, go up to edit, and there should be a convert to profile or color settings. Either way it's going to do more or less the same thing. I'll do convert to profile though. After you go to edit, convert to profile, Again, you might have Pro Photo or Adobe, something else. Change it to sRGB and then hit OK. When you do that, it's going to flatten the photo, then you're going to lose all your layers. So you got to be careful because you might accidentally just ruin your TIFF if you don't do things correctly. And I know you're probably worn out by this point in the video and you might get kind of lost. So I just want to make sure we cover all our bases today, even when saving our images. But now if you go File, Save As, it should say sRGB and the box should be checked. We can save this as a JPEG. And again, we'll call this Orion YouTube. Hit save, quality, I normally go with nine. That works for me. And then hit okay. The biggest mistake you can make right now after you've saved your JPEG is to close out of this and hit yes. Because what you'll just do is overrate that TIFF file with all those layers with this flattened image. And that means all the work you've done today, you'll never be able to go back and adjust it. So you have to start all over from scratch. Therefore, you either want to hit no, that way it doesn't save over it, or cancel, then go up to your history tab and just find where you change it to 8 bits per channel. That was kind of the start of our JPEG process and click above it. If you did that correctly now, you should see all your layers are back here and our image is 16 bits per channel as it was. If you verify that everything looks good from before, we can go File, Save As, and make sure we're overwriting our TIFF file from before. I know this was probably kind of confusing, but I wanted to make sure we were really clear there. You might want to go back and rewatch that part of the video until you really comprehend what's going on. The main takeaway, is that if you want to save this as a JPEG, you just got to make sure a few things are set correctly. Otherwise, it might not display properly, but once you've saved as a JPEG, you want to verify that you still have access to all the TIFF edits so you can come back at any time. And that about does it for our Beginner's Astrophotography course here on YouTube. We covered a lot of ground in the past few videos. This one went on a lot longer than I planned to. If you enjoyed the course, though, and you want to learn how to do this type of editing and shooting for a lot of different objects, including the Andromeda Galaxy and the Horsehead Nebula, and the Heart Nebula, and all this other stuff, be sure to check out the courses on my website. Those each have between 15 to 20 plus hours of content, and we're going to go into a lot of detail like we did. That way, if you are kind of confused, you're probably going to pick it up a lot quicker than just a quick run through. I've also included my practice files just like we did today. That way you can follow along with me step by step. And even if you don't really have any good photos yet, you can still practice the editing portion and really learn these skills. That way when you finally do get your own good images, it'll be a lot easier to pick up. All right, well that does it for us today. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in another video.